I watched Fate the Wink Saga so you don't have to. A few weeks back, literally the same day that Fate the Wink Saga's trailer dropped, I posted an initial review slash reaction to it. And as I said at the end of that video, I'll still be tuning into Fate the Wink Saga once it's released in January, at least to see if I judge them too quickly. I know I've been harsh so far, but I actually do hope that they prove me wrong, although I doubt it'll happen. And surprise, surprise, the show did wind up disappointing me, although I will be honest and say that it wasn't nearly as awful as I was initially expecting. In fact, the season finale is actually somewhat enjoyable, but the show as a whole is predictable. Using tired tropes and unimaginative storylines we've seen time and time again in every other edgy teen show that's come out the past five years but this time it's just under a different clickbait, nostalgia-inducing title. Besides the plot of the show being predictable, there are a handful of other problems including uninteresting costuming, a complete misunderstanding of the Winx Club audience, and most notably, a lack of diversity as a result of blatant whitewashing. In today's video, I'll be talking about all of these issues and discuss how I, a person without hundreds of thousands of dollars from Netflix, would fix them. Yes, that includes the costuming. So if you happen to enjoy the series, then this isn't the video for you. But if you want to make your case in the comments below, go right ahead. That's as much your right to do as it is my right to make this video in the first place. Also, sorry about not including any footage from the show. It's my attempt to prevent Netflix from copyright claiming this video, which they had previously done to my completely fair use review of the trailer. Anyway, let's get into it. The Winx Club. For those who might not be familiar with the original Winx Club animated series, let me quickly fill you in. The Italian-made cartoon followed a group of girls who study at the Alfea College for Fairies on the planet Magix. The central protagonist, Bloom, is from Earth, and unbeknownst to her, she harnesses the power of the dragon's flame, making her powerful beyond belief. When the show began in 2004, there were five members of the Winx Club. Bloom, Musa, Tecna, Stella, and Flora, with Layla slash Aisha joining in season two and Roxy joining in season four. Each girl came from a different planet, had their own distinctive personality and interests, as well as their own unique magical powers that they used to fight evil. One of the most interesting parts about the show was the friendship between the Winx Club and how their relationship to one another, their world, and their powers evolved. A full-blown cultural phenomenon, there were Winx Club games, dolls, books, and even an amusement park. If you asked any girl my age about the Winx Club, they not only knew what you were talking about, but also knew which girl was their favorite. A product of the new millennium and the Y2K mentality, the series married fantasy with futurism, resulting in a unique aesthetic that differentiated the show from others about magical girls. That's the short and sweet summary, but honestly, the plot of the Winx Club, its impact, and its evolution over the years is far more complex. I'd suggest watching Unicorn of War's videos about the subject. Fate the Winx Saga We're headed into spoiler territory. If that is something you're concerned about, then please skip ahead. Don't say I didn't warn you. Fate the Wink Saga follows Bloom, an outsider from the first world, California, who is brought to a fairy school in the other world called Alfea after an incident where she accidentally sets her house on fire. Yes, they've changed the name from Magics to Otherworld and made the places realms, not planets. I guess to make it sound edgier. Although in my mind, Otherworld will always be the name of a certain fanfiction from the 2000s. If you know, you know. Their fairy society used to have wings, but for some reason, they've lost that ability. I'm conflicted over this decision because obviously it was an issue with the budget, and they do appear at the end of the season, but I wish we could have seen it used more often and not only on Bloom. Considering live-action wings have been done well before, in X-Men First Class or Carnival Row, for example, it would have been a nice addition considering how dissimilar the series is to the cartoon otherwise. And considering a lot of the other visual effects in the show are quite decent, it's pretty bizarre that they didn't want to use the wings more. As the new kid at Althea, Bloom initially struggles to fit in with the people who grew up in the realms of magic, before eventually befriending the rest of the girls who become a part of the Winx Club. But unfortunately, their friendship isn't by choice. It's a friendship of convenience as the girls wind up sharing the same suite in the school's boarding house. All of the fairies at Althea have different powers that correlate to a specific element. Bloom is a fire fairy, Aisha controls water, Terra earth, Musa is a mind fairy, and Stella has power over light. 
Because she's the chosen one, or whatever name you want to call that trope, Bloom is also the strongest fairy ever, which means pretty much all of the drama revolves around her, but she constantly manages to survive by the skin of her teeth and sheer dumb luck. While the show begins with the girls doing what every teen does in these types of series, partying, fighting, and flirting, the main, more dramatic storyline eventually starts up. Unbeknownst to the fairies, evil creatures known as the Burned Ones have returned to Otherworld, something the older generation of fairies were trying to hide from the younger. The Burned Ones make their way towards Althea, thrusting the school into turmoil. Although she initially thinks she's a human, Bloom discovers that she's a changeling, a fairy child switched with a human. This turns her world upside down, and Bloom spends the remainder of the season uncovering more about her unknown past and learning to control her growing powers. The more she learns, the more she begins to question the motives of the people surrounding her and the morality of the society she's joined. At the end of the season, the students and teachers of Althea bond together to try to stop the Burned Ones, with Bloom unleashing her ancient fairy powers to their full capacity for the first time, giving us the only Winx Saga transformation. After they've won, Bloom and the rest of her fairy friends join her and go to Earth where she finally reveals the truth to her parents that she's a fairy. In the final few minutes, the conflict for season two is set up. Skye's father, who had been presumed dead, is miraculously alive. Queen Luna, Stella's mother, has been covering up a genocide. And the school's headmistress is killed by a person who hopes to use Bloom's powers for her own desires. Adapting children's content into a live action can be difficult. There's no denying that. Think about all of the failed adaptations we've seen in the past. But it sure as hell isn't impossible. Just look at the recent His Dark Materials adaptation or a series of unfortunate events. You can feel the love for the source material in both of those series, but unfortunately, that love, care, and respect is noticeably missing from Fate the Winx Saga. I think if you genuinely know nothing about Winx and you enjoy Teen Wolf or Riverdale-esque shows, then I'll be honest, you'll probably like the Winx Saga. But if you're someone like me who literally grew up watching the cartoon on four kids, then this show will undoubtedly leave you feeling like your childhood's been ruined. Which brings up the question, why did it have to be Winx? If it's so far removed from the source material in tone, message, aesthetic, and plot, why couldn't it be a different random story about fairies? Let me answer my own obvious question with an obvious answer. Nostalgia-based clickbait. Fate is a young adult fantasy show. They wanted to take an audience that had watched this cartoon growing up and give them a new version of it. We are injecting life and death stakes like instantaneously on these girls. Showrunner Brian Young of the Vampire Diaries fame refers to the Winx Saga as, quote, a young adult fantasy show. And I half agree and half disagree. While it's definitely not for young adults, more for teens and tweens, it is a fantasy. A fantasy in that there's no sense of reality. It's just a bunch of tropes and cliches smushed into six episodes. These people don't care about making interesting, heartfelt adaptations of the shows we grew up watching because at the end of the day, they just care about how many views it gets. And I, probably like many of you, am tired of it. I miss seeing creativity, ingenuity, risks. Everything nowadays is just a remake of something that already came out. And I wouldn't have a problem with that if it was actually done well. And if you couldn't tell, the Winx Saga doesn't do it well. One positive thing that I can say about the show, and there are very few, is that while the setting of Otherworld is rather plain in comparison to the original world of Althea, no offense to Ireland, I think the choice to have an entirely British cast aside from Bloom is smart. Obvious, but smart. It makes it very clear to the audience that she doesn't fit in from a very understandable cultural standpoint. I also appreciate the decision to make the students of Althea any gender. The idea that fairies can only be girls and specialists can only be boys does feel a bit dated. Although, I think more should have been done in regard to aesthetics to make it more obvious that these two groups are very different. In the cartoon, specialists rely on technology and hand-to-hand -hand combat because they don't have any magical powers, and as a result, they dress in a very different way than the fairies do. But in the Winx Saga, both sides look exactly the same. With the specialist's uniform looking like every other vaguely medieval fantasy soldier we've seen before on TV. If Batman can have a cape, so can they. This is a small example of a big problem the show has. Visuals that disregard the world of the original series entirely. The Winx Club wasn't your normal fantasy show about magical creatures. It was a reflection of its time period. Instead of making the show purely fantastical and magical, they added technology and futurism to create their aesthetic. 
In the 2000s, our culture was obsessed with innovation. We were experimenting with technology and fantasizing about the future. The world in the cartoons featured both magic and technology, teaching the girls that they couldn't and shouldn't rely on their powers to do everything. But the Winx saga is firmly rooted in the present, to the extent that one of the coolest members of the Winx Club, Tecna, was erased from the reboot because her technology power doesn't fit its new direction. This leaves the Winx saga looking like any other magic-y movie or show that's come out recently, Charmed and The Craft Legacy most notably. If you have access to one of the most interesting and creative magical worlds in recent history, why wouldn't you use it? I'm not asking for much, but a touchscreen here and there, a floating vehicle, but nope, all we get are smartphones and constant references to Instagram. Imagine being Bloom, someone growing up in the normal human world, suddenly having access to all of this crazy technology. Wouldn't that make her seem all the more backward and weird to the other school kids, making it even harder for her to fit in and find her place? The relationship between the girls in the Winx saga feels somewhat lackluster. We never get a genuine moment where these girls realize that they enjoy being around one another or have any similar interests. Instead, it feels like when they do decide to band together, it's out of a weird sense of obligation. They rarely hang out as an entire group, mostly breaking off into pairs throughout the show. Overall, their relationships feel inauthentic and one note. Lines that are meant to be playful banter come off as hostile, and the moments that are meant to be touching fall flat. Everyone treats Tara like a doormat for the majority of the season, although she and Musa do eventually come to have the most believable friendship out of the group. Stella is rude to practically everyone in the show until she has a humiliating experience with her mother, and the group embrace her even though they have no reason to. And Aisha spends the majority of the season acting like the group's mother instead of their friend. When she does have a problem of her own, no one bothers to help her, including Bloom, who Aisha spends the season babysitting on and off. The group's emotional distance isn't helped by the fact that one of the major storylines of the season is the drama surrounding a love triangle between Bloom, Stella, and Skye, which didn't exist in the cartoons. I guess girls can't just be friends? We always need to throw a boy in the mix? Bloom's relationship with Skye is pretty boring. It's just snarky back and forths constantly. They try to make it seem as though it's a sweet relationship, but that's just because it's less toxic than his relationship with Stella. From the moment he meets Bloom, he starts negging her, but she's weirdly enamored with him, telling him important secret things about herself, even though the two basically never hang out early on, except to create tension with Stella. And because this show is trying its damnedest to appear woke, we constantly have characters acknowledging the patriarchy or talking about mansplaining, but it just comes off as patronizing. People need to realize addressing that sexism exists does not solve the problem. Also, this series is obviously written by people with no understanding of actual teenagers. The constant references to basic bitches and Harry Potter feels like what a middle-aged man thinks teenagers talk about. Now here's a really positive thing that I have to say about this show, and it's something I was taken surprised by, the lack of sex. A big problem I have with other edgy teen shows is the decision to have the characters be high schoolers while having them act like adults. There's almost nothing about the plot that would change if they were older. In fact, it explained why most of them don't look like teenagers. The sexualization of underage characters is so easily accepted just because the actors portraying them are adults, so it's nice for once to not have to see that on screen. And no, this isn't me being a prude. Obviously, teenagers are going to have sex but the act of filming it is literally illegal in the real world. So why is it okay for teen characters to have sex on screen as long as they're not actually played by teenagers? It's a very creepy loophole that is made even creepier when these teenagers proceed to have sex with characters who are meant to be adults and their relationship proceeds to be romanticized. Looking at you, Riverdale and Pretty Little Liars, it's incredibly predatory behavior. I don't think you're supposed to use that kind of language in front of a student. Yeah, you know what else you're not supposed to do is sleep with them. But that didn't stop me. Unless the plot of your show literally hinges on them applying for university, I cannot think of a single good reason that it couldn't be about 20-somethings. So considering the fact that the characters in the Wink Saga are 16, 17 years old, I'm incredibly pleased that we don't see them doing anything crazy. Yes, they talk about having sex or doing drugs, but otherwise, it mostly happens off-screen. And for that, I am grateful. 
When asked by TV Kids about Fate the Winx Saga, creator of the Winx Club, Eugenio Straffi, mentioned that the show was going to skew older for an older audience. Quote, For those fans, the 20-year-olds who still like to watch Winx, they will hopefully find their sweet spot in the Netflix live-action version. It is edgier and darker than what they can imagine after being used to the colorful world of Winx. The target is clearly young adults. The things we had to tone down in the animation have been emphasized in the live action. The relationships, the fights, the love stories. End quote. If the people behind Wing Saga were making a show for fans of the original series, as they claim, why is the story following 16-year-olds? The Winx Club premiered in 2004. If you were old enough to actually understand what was happening on screen when it was first airing, not just looking at the pretty colors and shapes, you'd be well into your 20s at this point. As a 20-something, their supposed target demographic, I can safely say that watching teenagers deal with toxic relationships isn't really my thing. I wanted to see a strong group of friends kicking ass and proving that there's nothing wrong with femininity. This shows how deeply the creators of the Winx Saga misunderstand its audience and what they loved about the Winx Club to begin with. Because the people in charge of the show have repeatedly stated that they wanted this to be diverse and modern, I have to wonder, where are all the gay people? While technically no one's sexuality is explicitly stated, the only characters who are hinted at being potentially queer are the antagonists. I'm not saying you have to read into that, but you can if you want to. There's also a lot of weird, homophobic lines in the series that feel dated and out of touch. Yes, this character is shown to be an asshole, so we're not surprised when he says these things, but he also doesn't have any consequences. Where's the lesson in that? We've already seen the Winx girls in straight, heteronormative relationships in the cartoon. Why not actually make an important and meaningful change in that regard? This reboot had years of amazing material to work with, and certain storylines from the Winx Club were dark to begin with. Why not make something fun that kept the heart of the original story while modernizing it and having it hold its own? Just because you want something to be edgy with mature themes doesn't mean it has to be boring. Jawbreaker and Promising Young Woman both feature dark subject matter and brilliantly use bright, candy-inspired color palettes to juxtapose that. Even Netflix's own Bridgerton isn't afraid of using neon colors and pastels. It's also such a simple way to make a story more visually dynamic. If we started off with a bright and colorful other world, it'd be all the more impactful when the show becomes literally and figuratively darker. If you're going to use the Winx name, make sure it's actually Winx, not just random magical teenagers. The whitewashing. Now it's time we talk about the erasure of POC characters in Fate the Winx Saga, and why that alone should be enough reason to consider this a bad adaptation. As I mentioned in my initial trailer review, one of my favorite things about the Winx Club was its diversity. Of the six original Winx Club members, three were made to look like and were coded as women of color. According to Eugenio Straffi, the girls were each designed to resemble a famous celebrity of the 2000s. Britney Spears was the inspiration for Bloom, Cameron Diaz for Stella, Jennifer Lopez for Flora, Pink for Tecna, Lucy Liu for Musa, and Beyonce for Layla slash Aisha. Imagine being a little girl in the 2000s who was finally able to see someone who looked like her in a cartoon, and that person was strong and magical and beautiful. Then imagine a decade later when they remake that same show, they've erased you from it. It's utterly disappointing. I couldn't be happier that with the casting of Precious Mustafa, we have a beautiful black actress playing Aisha, but that doesn't give the show a free pass to erase Musa and Flora and replace them with white women. It isn't enough for TV shows to put one woman of color in their all-white casts and call it a day, especially when the source material was more diverse to begin with. Do better, it's 2021. And before I see any obtuse comments about the casting of Halle Bailey as Ariel in the live-action Little Mermaid adaptation, because yes, it is related to this conversation, that is not blackwashing, or whatever the hell other ignorant word you've made up. Women of color, especially black women, have systematically received less opportunities than white women, and that is a fact. In Disney's own official princess lineup, Tiana is the only black princess, standing right alongside seven white women, three of whom have blonde hair. Do you know how many white mermaids there have been on screen? Many. Do you know how many black mermaids there have been? None. White mermaids are not an endangered species. Disney's story of The Little Mermaid is already drastically different from the source material. She literally dies in the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. 
The only criteria the Disney live action adaptation needs to meet is Ariel being a singing mermaid. That's it. Replacing people of color with white actors is a problem because the majority of roles are already given to white people. Doing the opposite does not erase the amount of white representation you'll see on screen because they are still the majority. Everyone deserves to see themselves as a princess, not just white women. Anyway, let's talk about Flora. As mentioned, her character in the cartoon is coded as Hispanic Latina, but in the Winx saga, she's been replaced by a different character, Tara, who is also an Earth Fairy. I already know people will say, it's a different character, so she can be white. But here's the thing, it isn't a different character. In the initial press release, actress Elliot Salt was listed as playing Flora. It's even shown on her acting portfolio. And in a leaked audition tape, a character is talking to Flora, not Tara. In the show, they briefly say that Tara is a cousin of Flora's, probably to do some damage control and set up a situation in the next season where they can introduce Flora and save their asses. But from what I understand, the main reason for changing Flora's appearance was because they wanted a plus-sized character to make the show realistic and create more representation. As stated by showrunner Brian Young in an interview with The Guardian, quote, Nobody looks like that. It was the most important thing to me that every kid can feel like they see themselves in it. Real girls, real people, unquote. While the body diversity is a great addition, because let's be honest, the Winx Club only showed one unattainable body type, that doesn't make this okay. Hollywood has a lot of trouble understanding that women can be more than one thing. You can be plus-sized and a person of color. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You wouldn't have needed to rewrite the character for damage control if you'd had the idea to cast a plus-sized woman of color to begin with. And then instead of actually making her a good representation of body inclusivity, Tara is treated poorly by everybody. She's bullied for both her personality and appearance, with only a few moments of strength sprinkled throughout the show. Why not just make her confident to begin with and not deal with the stereotypical, oh, let's make fun of the bigger girl plotline? What's also ridiculous is that out of all the girls, she's actually the most likable character, making the rest of them look all the more mean and catty as a result. They could have done great things with this character, but instead they just wound up taking a step back in multiple directions. As for Musa, played by Elijah Applebaum, the character is meant to be East Asian. In the Winx Club, Musa's home planet, Melody, is designed to resemble China, not only in architecture, but culturally. The planet's king is literally dressed like an emperor. Musa herself wears dozens of outfits over the course of the animated series that take inspiration from East Asian traditional garb, specifically China and Japan. Considering all of this information, plus the fact that her character is designed after Lucy Liu, a Chinese-American, her character should be played by someone who looks East Asian. I'm not sure what Elijah's ethnicity is, and I don't think she's under any obligation to reveal that private information if she doesn't want to, but the fact of the matter is that she is white passing. This role should not have gone to her when there are no doubt many other capable Asian actresses who would have fit the part. This whole whitewashing situation is incredibly disappointing, but I guess with white men in charge, I shouldn't be surprised? The fashion. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the outfits in the Winx Saga. If you've watched this channel before, then you already know that I have a high level of appreciation for costume design and the work costume designers do. But when you're given Netflix money and a year's worth of material to base the wardrobe off of, and you still manage to screw it up this badly, it needs to be addressed. Catherine Adair, the costume designer for the show, is not the person I would have thought of to outfit this series. I would have considered Lisa Evans, Vicki Barrett, Mary Jane Fort, other people with experienced dressing teen characters. The last time Catherine Adair did the costume design for a group of women was for Desperate Housewives, and I think that's the problem right there. She's used to dressing middle-aged women, not teenagers. The girls in the Winx saga are literally dressed like women in their mid-30s back in 2015, with none of them having any distinguishable aesthetics whatsoever. It's dated and unflattering and, most importantly, boring. All things the fashion in Winx Club was not. The animated series literally had real-life fashion designers creating the outfits the girls wore, and that's a big part of what made the show so successful. It wasn't just the magic that made us want to be those girls, it was their clothes too. 
For the people that are going to say that they had to tone down the outfits to fit a darker story, I strongly disagree. Skins, the UK version, covered an incredibly dark side of adolescence, and yet they weren't afraid of color. Euphoria is a perfect example of a show surrounding the same age demographic with an equally dark, maybe even darker, tone that still manages to have fun with fashion. Hell, that show wound up influencing real-life fashion and makeup trends. That's what the Winx Saga deserved. 2000s-inspired clothing has been making a huge comeback recently, and it astounds me that the show didn't want to capitalize on that. I'm not saying that the characters need to dress exactly like their cartoon counterparts, because let's be real, certain things work best in animation, but the essence of their style should still be there because it matches their individual personalities. If you've changed what they wear, you didn't understand the girls to begin with. The following is what I would have done if I were dressing the girls in the Wings Saga, and I'll even keep in mind the shift in tone and change in location. Having Bloom wear red in nearly every scene just because she's a fire fairy is not only an incredibly boring and uninspired visual, but it also makes no sense. Even if red were her favorite color, she would still wear other colored clothing, because that's what real people do. I'm assuming they tried to do the color coding technique that we often see in cartoons, but because this show is so uncartoon like, it just looks strange. Her wardrobe in the show features skinny jeans, turtlenecks, and leather jackets. She literally owns like five different ones. Overall, her character winds up looking like Emma Swan from Once Upon a Time, and that's a grown ass woman. Looking at Bloom's outfits from the animated series, I'd describe her style as the 90s slash 2000s girl next door. Think Donna from That 70s Show or Joey from Dawson's Creek. The character is a little bit insecure at first, stubborn with a short temper, but she also has a hint of innocence and puts other people's needs in front of her own. Keeping the weather in mind, I feel like the obvious choice is to put Bloom in a pair of blue jeans, but instead of the boring skinny jeans she wears throughout the show, flared or straight leg instead. Something cool, casual, and most importantly, comfortable. Hell, even a pair of overalls could have been interesting. Considering she's the only character from California, it'd be really cool to have her in a distinctly American look. Give her some retro sneakers and an interesting graphic tee and you're set. Compared to the other girls, I think Bloom has the most reason to cover up, to try and blend into the background. Since Bloom spends the season confused about her background, it'd be interesting to see her in simpler clothing before gaining confidence and dressing to reflect that, perhaps revealing more skin or generally wearing more intense colors as time passes. Throw in a crop top here or there, maybe a denim skirt. That's when we can start fooling around with the deeper shades of red to symbolize her turbulent mental state and emotions, as well as her loss of faith in the system. Then at the end of the season, when things have been resolved, we can return to brighter colors. Just like Bloom, Aisha's character suffers from an uninspired color palette. She's a water fairy, so they dress her entirely in blue. They've also changed the character's personality, making her a little bit more uptight and school-oriented, constantly fretting about getting bad grades. She's characterized as a teacher's pet, and the other characters often ridicule her for trying to get into their good graces. If I was following her characterization from the cartoon, I think Aisha would probably dress in a sporty, 90s-inspired aesthetic. Low-rise jeans, track pants, cargo pants, tank tops. Even in this show, she's athletic, stating she goes swimming twice a day every day, although that character trait seems to disappear after the first episode. I think she'd wear things that are a little more sporty during the day, especially during magic class, but outside of school, she'd wear cool dresses and cute little skirts. Out of all the characters, I see her embracing the Y2K look the most. My god, wouldn't it be cool to see her in some vans, loose jeans, and a cute cropped tank top? If it's cold outside, layer a patterned top underneath or just give her a large baggy hoodie. I think having her dress this way would also make for a great message. You can dress however you want and it doesn't mean you're less smart or less hardworking. It's your actions that count. Since Tara is obviously inspired by Flora, I'll be taking inspiration from that character's style in the cartoon. Besides whitewashing the character, the subtle censorship and lack of attention to dressing a plus-sized character is way too obvious. Out of all of the girls, her style is the most unrealized, with the majority of her outfits covering her body as if to hide it, and she basically spends the entire show wearing olive green. Just because she isn't skinny doesn't mean her character can't have style. 
Go on Instagram and you can find hundreds of beautiful, fashion-forward women who aren't society's definition of the ideal body type. It's totally unacceptable. Because Flora has a very sweet personality, even in this show, I think she'd best suit a dainty and feminine aesthetic. Maybe something cottagecore inspired, prairie-esque? Phoebe Buffay in 2020, basically. I'd love to see Flora in beautiful lace blouses, floral skirts, and ruffled dresses. Because Flora's character rarely, if ever, wore pants, I think the live-action version should do the exact same thing. She should be girly as all hell. The flowier silhouette would also be a nice juxtaposition to her elemental power. Earth is so solid, but she'd be more flexible. I think neutral shades of brown and green fit nicely with this version of the character, as well as white and pastel pink. The exact shade of neon pink that Flora wears in the cartoons is pretty tough to pull off, so I think going for more muted shades is a smarter choice. The fashionista of the Winx Club, the Winx Saga version of Stella dresses like she's auditioning to be on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. A lot of sparkles, pastel pink, and long ass coats. I always saw the cartoon version of Stella as a Sharpay Evans Paris Hilton type, but for a live action adaptation, I can understand how that character wouldn't necessarily fit in with the rest of the world. But my god, do I hate her character in the show. In the cartoon, she's the first person to befriend Bloom. Here, they're constantly at odds. She's snobby and rude with huge insecurities because of her mother's overbearing nature. Considering Stella is a princess, one who feels bound to her duty and thinks appearances are all important, I think she would have continued her love of feminine colors with refined, fashion-forward pieces. She wouldn't dress like everyone else. She'd definitely be rocking designer items. Some 90s Chanel, maybe? Or maybe more modern European brands like House of Sunny, Stoud, Saks Potts, Jacques Mousse. You get it. She's that girl on Instagram whose photos are all over Pinterest and who make you wonder if something is actually cute or she just makes it look good. Because her relationship with her mother is so strained and Stella's constantly controlled by her, it would be interesting to see a stark difference in how she dresses when her mother is away versus how she dresses when her mother is around. Maybe showing off more skin normally, her legs or her arms, and then covering up more in front of her mother. This would also fit her more flirtatious nature and make Bloom feel more insecure about her budding relationship with Skye. While Tara's outfits are boring, Muses are just plain old ugly and genuinely made me mistake her for Tecna in the trailer. Although she is sadly no longer a music fairy in the Wink saga, her character is still associated with it. An ex-dancer, she uses it as a way of blocking out the sound of other people's minds. I think taking inspiration from that aspect of her cartoon character is still appropriate, and makes for a unique look when compared to the other characters. Because her character is meant to be East Asian, I think it'd be interesting to see her wear outfits inspired by Chinese, Korean, and Japanese street style with a hint of punk influence. She'd wear leg warmers, tennis skirts, crop tops, platform shoes, fishnet tights, vinyl, and a whole lot of silver jewelry. She'd look like she could walk onto the set of a Blackpink music video and absolutely kill it. It also makes sense for her character to try and look a little scary and maybe intimidating. It'd keep people away and the thoughts at bay. Sure, she's not in the Winx saga, but that doesn't mean that one day she won't be. So Netflix, take notes. Queen of the cyberpunk aesthetic, Tecna's style would be alt-fashion perfected. She'd probably take style inspiration from Acid Burn in Hackers, Violet in Ultraviolet, and Aeon from Aeon Flux. With her fuchsia hair, Tecna would either wear bright neons to match it, or she'd go with an all-black Matrix-inspired outfit. I could see her wearing not only shades of purple, but green, pink, and orange as well. Without a doubt, one of the more colorful Winx girls. She'd probably gravitate towards metallics, reflective fabrics, and mesh. While she'd mostly wear pants, she wouldn't be afraid of wearing a teeny tiny skirt when the occasion arrives. Her must-have accessory would be a harness, loaded up with the 30 different devices she needs to get through the day. As a tech fairy, I think Tecna would be really into using social media for fashion inspiration. And aside from Stella, I see her as being one of the more adventurous girls when it comes to style. Well, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. What were your thoughts on Fate the Wink Saga? Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!